little notification. There it is. Um, if you guys have any questions about um, recording and stuff, feel free to reach out. Um, yeah. Um, so as most of you know, we're here to talk about Rifka by Mohammed El Kurd and Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis. I'm so excited for the discussion that will come of today's meeting. Um, we're first going to do some introductions and a little bit of an icebreaker uh, to just, you know, break the ice, get to know each other a little bit. Um, and once you answer, uh, make sure you popcorn um, to somebody else in the room. Um, I will go first. Um, also, let us know where you are in the world today because I I feel like we have a uh, quite the variety um in this Zoom room. Yeah. Um, my name is Morgan. I am one of the hardcover hotties admin. Um, I use she her pronouns. Um. And the I'm in Columbus currently. Um, Stephanie, I believe, dropped the icebreaker question, which is, what is a song that motivates you in moments of political exhaustion? Um, um, I think this is just such a hard uh, question because there are like a lot of them. Um, the first like few that come to mind are well I'm just Kimia Dawson's biggest fan in the world and a lot of her songs like are just really hopeful and like center on like love and like friendship and I feel like whenever I'm just feeling you know downtrodden I feel like she can always you know give give me a little hug through the through the my headphones um yeah I'll start there and I'm gonna popcorn it to uh Julia hi um okay so yeah my name is Julia my pronouns are she her and um a song that gives me some hope is It's Plenty by Burna Boy because it's really cheerful and upbeat. And I'm going to popcorn it to uh, Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen. <laughs> um, sorry, that was crazy. Um, I use they, she pronouns. Um, I'm also a hardcover hotties admin, and hmm, I feel like Kitty Craft, Kitty Craft tat will get me feeling happy and warm. Um, but also like on the other side, I feel like I listen to like punk when I'm like I'll listen to something angry also, but not too too angry. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to popcorn it to Ocean. Okay, I feel like I chose someone who's not that exciting. I'm also getting over like the cool, so I probably sound snotty. But I was going to say just no name. I really like Rainforest. I know it's not like super exciting, but I just love when she's like, this pussy ta taught ninth grade like colonials or whatever. And I'm like, you better. And I just love how open she is about talking about that shit, even though like her career. Well, yeah, she talks about how her career struggles with it in general. But I think it's so cool how she literally just doesn't give a fuck. And she literally brings that stuff into her music and into her art. So, um, I'll popcorn it to Grace. Hi, um, my name is Grace. I use they and she pronouns, 
and currently in St. Louis. Um, and I don't know if it like, I, I, I think my mind kind of went to like, I feel like when I get like overwhelmed or whatever, like I don't listen to like a lot of like new agey music, but like I do really like um, Beverly Glenn Copeland. And like, I usually just put on like one of his albums, but like, I think La Vida is like what opens like the album Primal Prayer. And like, that one's really beautiful. And like, yeah, I mean, he's just like, it's like very like, I don't know, like, it's like very beautiful and like, but also very like, I don't know, grounded in like pain. And I feel like that like, um, is like, I find that like just overall, like kind of like grounding to listen to. So yeah, that's my um, rec, all popcorn to Stephanie. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie. Um, I use she, they pronouns and I'm coming to you all uh, I've been visiting my family in Los Angeles for the past couple of days, but I'm actually in Long Beach right now. Um, and But I'm still really excited to be here. This is, book club is always going to be part of the vacation itinerary. So, um, and a song that motivates me in moments of political exhaustion recently, it's this song called I Wait by Galen Lea who I actually added to the Hardcover Hotties collaborative playlist, who, which the link I will be dropping right now if you guys want to add your songs on there. But Galen Leia is like a violinist and a lot of her music is focused on like ho hopeful messages. So she's also like a disability um, activist and talks like the song I Wait is basically like as as you would assume from the title like the anticipation and like the exhaustion that exhaustion that comes before like action and kind of like the patience and hope that is like needed to keep you going in all those moments so you guys should give it a listen in the playlist link and add you guys the songs too but i'm going to popcorn to um Charles Hello. is this on my face wait is it is it on my face I can't see it yes so I'll just hope that the angle is okay hi everyone I'm Charles I use he him pronouns um I think my go-to songs for when I'm facing political exhaustion is first and foremost, um, Don't Dream It's Over by Crowded House. That that like gets me after every um, uh, horrible like election defeat. <laughs> That's like what I turn on, um, especially when Trump won, horrible. Um, and then also I listen to a lot of Bjork. Um, she has some really crazy, like crazy political songs. And so I will now popcorn it to Allison. Hi, I'm Allison. And she, her pronouns. Um, just a song. I think I like to be pretty tap into anger. Um, so I think a song that I really like was um, Shove It by Santa Gold, because I've been listening to her a lot lately. Um, and I will pass it to Aria. Um, I'm Aria, she, her. Um, I think someday, someday we'll all be free by Donny Hathaway is what I've been thinking about. Um, yeah, it's very pretty. And also I've discovered a new artist recently named Labby Seafree, and he sings like bulky, soulful stuff. And it's like, it's very nice. And he was like openly gay in like the seventies and it's very like, live instrumentation so i'm like yes yes i like that and i guess i'll popcorn ocean if they haven't gone i have but i did mess up because i just went so quick to just my song but i'm in st louis y'all and i use 
they them pronouns but i actually i feel like more recently i'm kind of fine with more like she them or she they so yeah i think that's everyone though <laughs> August, have you gone? I uh, know I just got here. Um, so I'm not sure what the prompt is. I know we're talking about music. I'm not sure if there's a specific prompt though, if it's just like music we like. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I just dropped the icebreaker in okay. text in the chat, but it's what is a song that motivates you in moments of political exhaustion? Ooh, okay. So first, I'm August. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Um, you can't see my face right now because I just got out of the shower, but um, yeah. Um, and, oh God, I don't know. I listen to whoever said like they tend to tap into more like anger. I also find that I kind of tend to do that as I tend to listen to more kind of upbeat stuff even if like like angry stuff um and it just I I don't know I find it motivating and kind of keeps me keeps me going if I'm kind of feeling like that exhaustion I find it motivating to things that get me like fired up again <laughs> and that's I think that's very true okay uh I think I'm pretty sure I'm the last one, the one who hasn't gone yet. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Finn. I'm I use he him pronouns, and I'm also in Columbus. And um, a song that motivates me in times of political upheaval. It isn't very original, but one I find one I find myself going back to is "Changes" by Tupac. I think it's a it's a very dark song that sort of um, puts forward the struggle, but it also puts forward a vision. And I think that's often what I need is for somebody to reaffirm me in the struggle, but also sort of give a, a light uh, to the to the path. So uh, yeah. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, I also know that it's hard to cope with the song on the top of your head, but of course you guys ate. To address the elephant in the room, if you're feeling a vacant a vacant square, there's there's one missing or a vacancy in your heart. It's because our hardcover hotties admin, Lauren Marshall, unfortunately has to work during the meeting. So Lauren is will be in our hearts. And yeah, I know. Um, we're gonna drop we're gonna drop her workplace down in the comments go no just kidding but um yeah so we that's why we have to work extra hard to produce a beautiful recording for her so she can she can watch on her own time I'm also gonna drop my album rec in there too that I feel like you guys would enjoy and I'm going to drop in the link to the pdf of freedom is a constant struggle in case at any point you guys want to open up and like reference anything or pull up like any specific chapter feel free to take a look there but as we mentioned earlier we're here to discuss rifka and freedom is a constant struggle by mohammed elker and angela davis so we're very excited to have the privilege to be like working closely with poetry for the first time as a group it's something that we've been interested in for a while but haven't ha like found like the specific moment to do a double feature but when it comes to showing solidarity with palestine what better time to put in that like tiny bit of extra effort than now so thank you guys for also working with us in a month where we have like two texts that we're, we've selected. Um, since there are two te texts, we do have questions that you guys can reference for both. And if at any point there's one text that you maybe were able to spend a bit more time 
with or like caught your attention more feel free to like take the conversation with like whatever comes to mind first but we're going to drop in some questions in the beating chat and yeah we're just gonna start off by talking about your guys's experience with pairing um creative nonfiction and like essays and like um theoretical frameworks and how they kind of just like worked in collaboration to like build everyone's like further understanding of Palestinian struggle. Also feel free to re reference any of the questions in the chat as well. Also, for reference, do you guys have much experience with poetry, like, before this month? Or, like, um, do, do you guys, like, what what poetry have, like, you engaged with that maybe, like, was similar to, like, themes in, like, Rivka? I know that there's a book of poetry that I really like that has sort of a similar... Um, like, I guess, kind of a similar subject matter, and it's called Deaf Republic, um, and it's about, like, the Soviet Union, and it's, like, written by um, this guy who, like, grew up in, like, the Soviet Union, and um, so kind of, and then wrote about, like, sort of a fictionalized version of his experiences, and it's it's written entirely in poetry, and it incorporates, like, a lot of, like, different, like, elements of sign language and um that I find that really moving when people kind of use poetry in that way it kind of I feel like it gives you a an idea of the struggle that like you can't get from just like reading like reading theoretical texts is like important for some things but then like there's some things that like you can only get from sort of more I don't know, like, like feelings-based things like poetry. Yeah, um, kind of going off reading, this reminded me of um, in a class I took in college, I think it was, I think it was like feminist political theory was the class. Um, so like very like, yeah, political theory was like what we were studying, but my teacher assigned um, Natalie Diaz's post-colonial love poem, um, which is like a book of poetry. And, um, that one, like, that one, like, I mean, it's similar in that it's like, yeah, also talking about like post-coloniality, um, or like the colonial condition. Um, she's also, she's, um, Native American when was like writing from, from that perspective. Um, but that, that experience was really great because like my, I liked my professor was kind of like pushing us to think about like, what like expanding like what can be theory and what we can like be what kind of texts we can like be looking to for like kind of like important theoretical like interventions and stuff like that so I I yeah I feel like that like definitely was thinking about that reading Rivka too just because like certainly like I mean yeah he's writing like both like with like so much yeah just like writing his like experience and there's so much emotion and also is like yeah obviously like like theoretically like doing a lot too and kind of like it's very like sharp and it's like um politics too I feel like something that I've heard from a lot of people both like just like in my life and just like in the world is that like a lot of people kind of find it easy to like kind of not think about Palestine because they're like it's so far away um and so they're like it's easy for them to kind of shut off like the empathetic part of their brain to like issues related to Palestine and so I think kind of I appreciated how kind of both of these like both of the things that we read this 
month, like kind of like the, the Angela Davis text kind of connected it to things that are happening in America um, in a way that kind of like, I feel like helps people realize like, look like this is connected to like things that are closer to you. And then I feel like the, the poetry, you know, kind of appeals to sort of like similar human experiences so that you can kind of get an idea of like here is like the emotions that people are feeling which I feel like makes it easier to empathize with people when you can kind of get an idea of what they're feeling which I feel like yeah I would definitely agree. I think that right now I'm just going to speak for myself. Um, having spent a lot of time and being in space where it's like very normal to engage with like texts or other forms of like information channels that give you that are very like US based or focused on like things like race, gender, sexuality, all of those things, but in the context that like relates most to like me as an individual and suddenly realizing like coming to face with like the privilege of being able to have such a focus like on U.S. centered like spaces um like really comes to light I know that for me as like someone who the extent of like global education also relates to me in like some aspects because I feel like I'm very educated on like Latin American struggles and like from their extensions in like the Caribbean but they're all like some sort of like um they all like connect to each other in some sort of way and I feel like that's what you're made to believe like the heuristic is that it's like supposed to connect with you immediately when in reality, as we've seen, especially with like the um, boycotting and like the divestment sanctions, like how much everything we we're doing does have such a global impact. So to take it from a more like theoretical information based approach and then have access to poetry that mirrors a lot of like the relationships and uh, experiences that relate to being just like a human in general kind of like very much like open you up to extending that sympathy and not exactly like sympathy but more more so like urgency to act and move in like solidarity with organizations which actually kind of brings me to one of the questions that um, definitely was coming to mind when reading Rivka, which was, I'll paste it again so you guys can see, but it what is the role, wait, sorry. What role does personal experience or familial intimacy specifically play in, specifically play in driving global movement? So if you've read like a little bit or made your purchase of Rivka, you probably um keen to know how family based it is like specifically with um uh, Mohammed El Kurd's um grandmother and there's a lot of conversation with his twin his sister who also engages in a lot of um activist um like movements so yeah what did you guys think about this question Um, like I had like kind of an impression while reading Rivka, it felt like it really humanized like Palestinians to me in a way that I feel like even some of the positive news coverage can like dehumanize by just making it into like grief and like, oh, these people are dispossessed or they're all like refugees. So it, it like, it was something I kind of didn't want to do because I know how horrible it is. I was like, I don't want to, this is like a unconscious thing really, but I was like, I don't want to like 
fully know these people as humans because it's like, oh, how horrible is it going to be to know that this horrible thing is happening? So it was nice to be forced to do that and like reckon with it as like, oh yeah, people are the exact same, which you always know, but it made me feel that that, you know, Palestinians have like artists and poets and like have other dreams than like living where they are and like struggle, even though that's like kind of what is being forced right now. But yeah, those are my thoughts. Uh, so what you said reminded me of one quote in Freedom is a Constant Struggle, and I and I don't have it, but I've, I've actually been quoting it to friends when we talk about uh, this stuff recently. And that's where she says that our own struggles, the struggles that we engage in, should provide, can provide doors and windows into other struggles, into, into other activist movements. And I think for me, that was just a really, really beautiful and succinct way of putting it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure that if this was exactly what you were asking, but for me, the, you know, we have personal experience dealing with certain struggles in America and we can definitely see, or at least maybe not personal experience, but very close experience, experience from those that are, you know, adjacent to us. And I think looking for parallels between what's happening in America and what's happening in Palestine and what has happened in America and what has happened in Palestine allows us to gain not only a sympathy for those people, but an understanding and a certain type of initiate, like an initiating agent of a sort of motivation to explore the conflict and understand and fight for freedom in a in a more global context and I, and I think that's something that that goes beyond Palestine um but uh just I want I would definitely want to get out there her her quote doors and windows uh because that to me was just just very striking and it, and it stuck with me since then um in terms of like what role does um personal experience play in driving global movement um i think it's like necessary um to <laughs> that per like uh sharing stories of personal experience and like being attuned to listening is like deeply necessary to any like um any efforts toward um like any any uh efforts toward like global or local activism um and i think that she i'm sure that she discusses this somewhere throughout the book but it might be I don't have a quote um but I think like something that we can sometimes get stuck in and I fe felt this like a lot like being in um philosophy college philosophy classrooms was that like theory was often like really separate um and impersonal um and if the people would or, or like it, it I would feel like a sense of detachment like in the room when like people were engaging with like theoretical texts which was like I think really difficult for me because when um in acting in global movement it's like necessary that we look to it, it it's necessary that we engage with and among like the people who are like at the center of it and if we leave personal experience out of that then that's like we're we're leaning into the exactly the things the harmful things that uh like oppressive systems are trying to perpetuate which is silencing the personal experience of like people 
silencing and erasing the personal experiences of those who need to be heard um and so I think that like having um yeah I think reading Rifka was like really um beautiful in that sense and I also Grace think that you did a really nice job of like saying that it was like just as much like a theoretical text as like anything else um and like expanding our understanding of what like theory can look like I think was useful here as well um yeah I think um I've just been thinking a lot about how I mean personal experience and sharing personal experiences is like an act of I think I think Angela Davis writes about this or like talks about this in um, her book, but like basic, sorry, (laughs) Um, like Israel or the U.S. wants to dehumanize um, like Palestinians and Black people. And um, the personal experience is like a direct resistance against that dehumanization. And I've been thinking a lot about how like reporting like semantics I guess and language and like just how um I think like reporters were using the terms like people under 18 instead of children and like how like it's so important to pay attention to those small like little changes in language because they're all like the ways that um the state takes away humanity and I just think that that's what and I I found in freedom as a constant struggle like that's also not a purely like theoretical text it's a lot of like I feel like there's a lot of storytelling in that too because telling stories is um just so like important to humanity and to like getting people to bear witness to what's going on is kind of where I was going Yeah, I'm also just thinking about how, like, I feel like in some, sometimes, like, things like grief and love are, like, I don't know, kind of considered, or, like, rendered, like, oh, just, like, like, apolitical, or, like, oh, like, they're, like, like, just universal, but, like, obviously are, like, super political things, and, like, I feel like, um, yeah, just, like, going off of what everyone is saying, and I feel like the way that like our grief and love can be like manipulated by by the media is like really powerful and like um and yeah but and also like I, I think yeah just like taking it back to the like question it's like I feel like that like it, like it's like I feel like these like political struggles are super personal because like they do like ultimately also have to do with our like grief and love I don't know I think um, for me, thinking about Rivka also as a form of art comes, it makes me like think of other forms of art that have like basically inspired so many people. And someone that comes to mind is an illustrator named Sally Samir, um, who I don't know if you guys, maybe you've seen some of her Instagram posts, but she takes like direct quotes from children and uh, um, different Palestinian people reacting to everything that is like being done like onto them and draws it in like a with like the lens of um, a children's book like illustration so when they speak of death they'll they'll be drawn like as angels and there have been like some drawings that where it's like um, a father is like mourning his children and there'll be like three angels like around yeah like I think like Morgan's trying to show one Um, and she'll also like include some quotes and I feel like it just is so powerful in reminding people how these relationships are just like echo and like can uh, relate to someone like wherever they are and really like 
adds the context of like the livelihood of each individual life that's lost because it can very easily turn into numbers so when artists are building the bridge of what we're exploring with like freedom is a constant struggle so like theoretical text and um, quantitative like frameworks when you kind of take a moment to step back and really let yourself like move with the emotional aspect of it it can be like it can be the bridge of like what takes something that you explore and like maybe let yourself like think about it heavily for like one moment and what like stays with you for a lifetime and like comes to mind and like certain experiences and moves you to actually like take action and regardless of the space that you're in so I definitely have been uh, appreciating like the space for the space of like that artists are taking up um, in the moment especially like Palestinian artists so if you guys have any more like artist directs please feel free to also drop it in the chat or send like a dm to the hardcover hotties instagram i have a short like recommendation if anybody is near in columbus near osu the Wexner Center has um, this like film, I think it's called Forgers, but it's like way deep in the exhibit. Um, if you know where the gallery is, just like go to the end, there'll be like a little screen, but it's like an hour little film about a Palestinian like forging for like plants and how they like come up against like Zionist resistance basically, but it's very, it's very slow. So you'll be there for a while, but it's quite meditative and I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. Uh, the artist uh, is, I'll drop her name in the chat, but um, Jumana Mana um, is who, whose exhibit is being shown at the WEX right now and whose documentary that is. Um, and yeah, the WEX, for those of you who aren't in Columbus, flopped big time uh, by like, pulling her off of the artist panel um, and like not giving her the space to speak on her work um, for BS reasons, but continue to like support her. And like, definitely if you're in Columbus, like, yeah, go see it. Cause that exhibit is so awesome. And I want to say foragers can be found like, online also so I'll try to drop that try to find that too thank you for sharing Aria okay um I don't really know if this has or goes with the question at all for real. But I was talking to my roommate the other day just about like disability awareness and stuff like that. And also some of the stuff happening in Palestine. And I had mentioned to her how like, oh, you know, did you see this one picture or the video of like, or just there's a lot of them actually of just people actually going back and digging up and helping like the elderly or helping people who are disabled, like get to safety as well. And all of them are like trying to not leave anyone behind. And I was thinking about like being here in the United States and how, I don't know, I feel like people here would be more likely to kind of like take care of ourselves, whereas like in Palestine, the people there, I feel like we're definitely more humane and are more like collectively, let's take care of one another and stuff like that. So, um, but I was thinking about how like, I am not disabled in that way, but I feel like one day, like I am going to get old and maybe I will have problems with like walking or whatever the reason may be or whatnot. And I'm going to have to depend on someone eventually to one day take care of me for all this and all that. But um, wait, where was I going with that? Hold on, pause on it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Back to it. No. So with the um, personal experiences and stuff like that, um, my roommate, neither of us are disabled in that way where we'd be worried about like getting left behind or stuff like that. But we were just talking about how how that could make people who are 
disabled here in the United States and maybe you're kind of like, fuck the Palestinian people or whatever they may be thinking, but maybe seeing um, some of the images that are going around of people who are disabled, like um, actually getting taken care of, you know, they can be put themselves in like that kind of perspective to be like, holy shit. Like, oh, we can curse. Okay, I'm such a curse. But anyways, they can be like, holy shit. Like, um, look at these people who we are acting like are not human, um, literally, actually, literally turning around and doing the most humane thing that they could do. So that's just something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. Ocean, with what you were just saying, um, it made me think of a part of the poem of a poem from Rifka called um, Smuggling Bethlehem. And it's on page 13 if you guys have the book with you. But it's basically Mohammed Alker talking about grow like spending time in Atlanta and being in the US and missing Palestine from the US. So kind of uh, the poem starts off comparing a little bit of like what the US experiences is like. And then it goes off saying, in Palestine, strangers walk around with open purses, open pockets, open palms, trusting the ruckus will affect everything but the integrity of those wrinkled around them, selling olives, figs, and words wrapped with clay. And then it kind of like goes on into that. But the line of trusting the ruckus will affect everything but the integrity really like struck like stuck with me and like I made sure to like um write that down because oh sorry there's like a plane passing by but um I feel like when you're in situations where you're made to be humble you're you're basically being humbled it also makes you the most aware of what are the thing, the values that should be driving your actions and what matters the most. So it is, I like the notion of like amongst chaos and political up upheaval, it kind of, instead of the heuristic of thinking like it brings out the worst in people, at the very same time, it can bring out the best in people because if you're already being surrounded by things that make you lose your faith, then the most, like, the best way to, to combat that, basically, would be to act in, like, contradiction of all of that and of all of the narratives that are being, like, pushed onto you. So I definitely do like that picture that um, Mohammed al like, brought in in that poem. What you just said about like disasters bringing out like the good parts of people kind of reminded me of, I think, I, I think it was some movie, but it was like the aftermath of, I think, Hurricane Katrina in like the Southern US. And obviously I don't think there was adequate support from the government. So you have all these stories of like random people essentially like banding together and creating like these leftist type organizations of like mutual aid. Um, just to try to help people out in the moment. And that's actually, if you know about Food Not Bombs, that's where that organization came from. Um, but yeah, because I think there's kind of like a myth that's like survival of the fittest and it's going to be like Mad Max if it, things like, go south. And I think it's just like capitalist propaganda, really. Um, but yeah, I like the point. This is the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to chill for a bit so other people could talk. But just this morning, so for those who came later on, for context, I'm in L.A. right now visiting my family. Um, they're coming in from El Salvador. And El Salvador is like a country in Central America that more like in the past 20 years has built a strong relationship with the U.S. and like has been implementing more like traditional capitalistic like structures and my aunt who is from El Salvador was talking about the okay so my basically my grandmother who lives in the U.S. was talking about 
how she misses the friendliness of everyone in El Salvador and how when you're walking um, down the street, everyone will go up to you and say hi. And it's way more normal for people to like give out basic information about each other where she feels like here it's very like watch your guard and like try you can't really trust people with like your belongings and um everyone's kind of just staying on their own road and my aunt was actually she was like oh if only you could see like in the past couple years it's actually been a shift away from that where it's only like in smaller like towns where people still hold that mindset but at the same time those smaller towns are seen as like the less educated towns and almost like looked down upon so she's like and she lives like more in the city and she was like yeah walking into places it's not as normal as it was like when you lived here for people to like be interacting in that way so with what um was being mentioned earlier I feel like it also goes to show how quickly a the like political structure that like exists around you can begin to like integrate like your own mentality and frameworks and the conversations that you're having and the, just like the way you move about the world like on an individual level becomes so representative of the group as like a collective so I feel like that's why it becomes like just that much more important to try to break away from that like in whatever way you can as an individual with yeah like with what just like being being friendlier to a, a day to day day to day times. Um, on that in on page one hundred six, and freedom is a constant struggle, which is the essay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, feminism and abolition theories and practices for the twenty first century. Um, Angela Davis says, someone attacks us verbally or otherwise, our response is what? A counterattack? The retru retru retributive, retributive impulses of the state are inscribed in our very emotional responses. The political reproduces itself through the personal, um, which I think is like, just so like what you're describing is like, yeah, the, the goal of the goal is to like to penetrate the personal and to like have your like interactions and like your connections and like the way like you said like the way that you interact in the world be representative of like these oppressive structures that like people in power are trying to perpetuate and I think that she yeah you said that awesome you said that awesome girl Yeah, I'm also thinking about, um, and like the the uh, line from Rift that you read made me think about too, how just like, I feel like even in the US, it feels really high stakes. I mean, and it is high stakes in a lot of cases to like have even just like basic conversations about like what's going on right now. And just like, because like, you know, there's this like sense that like we should like our job could be at risk or like our family could be at or like fam familial relationships could be at risk and like all of these kind of like like um little bits of like supposed like stability that we like have to hold on to to like stay afloat and like I feel like the line um both of those lines honestly yeah like just like I feel like if we like I don't know it becomes a lot easier to like act with integrity if we like can also see that like we actually don't have like just we don't have control over it like anything could be taken away and like that is like I feel like what yeah just like the line in the poem made me think of that and also I feel like what like just like is the wisdom that like a lot of like um Palestinian people are like I feel like I'm getting from Palestinians right now is like you don't have the like stability that like I don't know we think we might have and that like we can put that on the line too
I'm actually a liar because I'm gonna talk again. But um, so I really liked this question that I just re dropped in the chat, which is think about the title "Freedom is a Constant Struggle," originally derived from a popular freedom song. What is the necessity? Oh, what is the necessity of situating the struggle for liberation as a constant? How might this understanding be compatible with Octavia Butler's conception of change in which the only lasting truth is change? I want to take a moment to talk about just Angela Davis as a person in general and the context that's added. I really appreciate how the introduction of freedom is a constant struggle kind of speaks to some of like the misconceptions that people who are like newer to uh, um, uh, political activism might have about her as an individual and also her role. And uh, thank you, Julia, for coming. Uh, enjoy your evening. Okay. Um, yeah, so I really just feel like she embodies the constant aspect of it um, as like having the privilege of still having like access to her mind as we've seen like most recently in like the conversation she's like um, taken part in with, I think it was like called like Black Women Writers um like notes on palestine i'll try to look for like the youtube link and like drop it in or if like someone else could try to find it but um she is also coming out with another book called abolition i don't know if you guys saw that one i think it's coming out like later next year but to have access to her messages of hope as they like pertain to like the different experiences that like we're encountering like in each coming like decade because I feel like at every point people are like oh we never thought it would get we knew it was bad but we never thought it would get this bad and then it kind of just like lets you it can easily become a way to take a break and be like okay um this is like the worst it's gonna get like I, I it got so bad like it's out of my control when in reality, I feel like for so many people, it's always felt that way. And then on an individual level, it's so easy to feel that way. And that is basically like the goal. I This is kind of getting off the track, but I really liked how she talked. She like framed um, Nelson Mandela's like life's work and how she knows that he would like, very much dislike being uh, lifted up as an individual when he knows that everything that came from his actions were a collective effort. So, yeah, I don't have an actual point, just different things I wanted to say. If you guys have something to jump off from that, feel free. But Angela Davis is awesome. That was my point. Um, I feel like everything you just said is so perfect, Stephanie. Um, the constant thing kind of with what you just said as well, like, not to make it sound like, oh, it's nothing, it's never going to change, but I feel like there's always going to be some sort of struggle. Um, canoli, cano I can't even say it. Colonialism is always going to be a thing, like, white supremacy, that sounds so bad. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm saying it, but like white supremacy I feel like there's always going to be some people who try to keep those um, ideas enact and stuff like that. Um, and so going with like Angela Davis is saying that like it's constant. Um, I feel like it's more, it, it can kind of be something that's like, oh, we're constantly going to have to be battling this like big giant or whatever. But at the same time, I feel like we can also grow as well in our um, ability to like fight against those struggles um, or um, even with like Palestine and stuff like that. And some of the, her relating it back to like Ferguson and just like the black struggles in general, I feel like all 
of oppressed people's um, struggles and stuff like that are so connected. And it really is a lot to be blamed on like colonialism and like white supremacy and stuff like that. And so I feel like in some way, like she's kind of saying we can't allow ourselves to get like comfortable thinking like even with like the civil rights movement and stuff like that when that happened like when black people were able to go to school with other white kids or whatever like I feel like some people were like oh yeah we did the job but like the job is never done you know there's always going to be something else to continue pursuing and fighting for so um yeah that's pretty much it if anyone wants to follow on on that Uh, Real quick, know. just um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that that is a thing that um, I listened to. I I listened to the audiobook of um, "Freedom as a Constant Struggle," and that is like something that that she talked about. That I think um, is sort of like I don't know. Whenever I like when she was talking about it, it's it, I don't know. I don't know how everyone else felt when reading it or re listening to it, but it's kind of one of those things where it feels kind of extremely daunting. Like like the the just the 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 fact that it is constant is like both extremely daunting and also like kind of you know um, because like you're hearing other people talk about it, like you kind of feel not alone in knowing that there's like kind of this constant struggle but it definitely is like kind of hearing her talk about it there is like a part of a part that's like oh my god <laughs> like we got so much to do wait august literally purred everything you just said because you added to what i was just saying so beautifully and that's literally what I couldn't finish off that I was trying to say. But yeah, literally, it does sound daunting, like you're saying that, but it's always going to be constant. But when we like, share our stories, kind of like what we were talking about earlier with personal experiences and stuff like that, and we get to engage with other people and we get to hear their struggles as well. The fact that it is a constant thing, and if we're all listening to each other's stories and um collectively again because that's what it's really all about like if we can unite as a collective and know that like hey we're all oppressed in some way what is the thing that's oppressing like all of us or whatnot and let's fight it all together constantly you know there's always going to be a little bit of something coming back up but if we're constantly like educating ourselves reading having those conversations um giving people the pe pedestals to speak I mean like pedestals to speak and stuff like that knowing when to like shut up, which I'm learning a lot and take a seat and be quiet and listen to other people and stuff like that, then the constant isn't going to seem as like, oh, I can't handle it, you know, but that like where, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? <laughs> we're like dedicated, I guess. Um, I was thinking of a different word, but pretty much like we're dedicated enough to it that we're going to constantly be fighting and pursuing it. So I have so many thoughts. You just gave me like 12 of them. But like one thing I was thinking of when you talked about the civil rights struggle is like kind of like, where is it? Okay, I found this quote that kind of made me think about how that kind of turned out. And I see it. I see like going to school and having like more rights is kind of a win, definitely, but also like kind of assimilationism, which is less like revolutionary. And there's this quote from Rithka. Um, by Amal Dunkel, I think I'm reading that right. But it's, do not reconcile even if they gift you gold. If I were to gouge out your eyes and place gems in their place, would you still see? I kind of feel like that encapsulates like the constant struggle aspect and especially how, like sadly, I feel like a lot of the recent really potent, I won't include the Palestinian struggle in this, but a lot of the potent, protest movements the U.S. have like kind of been like like bid down and like asked to settle for reforms I feel like that has happened even though reforms are like cop city um 
Yeah, I'm just like, that sucks. Um, uh, yeah, that's, and also like, I feel like there, maybe we should normalize like struggle as like a part of your life. Like, oh, I have to do some work. Oh, I have to go situate my struggle in some part of my life. But yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, going off of like everyone, I feel like I'm thinking about how like, I feel like it's like, can be easy. Like, I don't know if you think about struggle as like something that is like outside of yourself, I guess, then it can be easy to think about like, oh, there's just like this like endless series of tasks that will be forever. But I feel like it's like thinking about like, I don't know, just like what everyone is saying is making me think about how like, I feel like it is also, it's just about like, I don't know, like stepping into and like taking your integrity seriously, which is like, that is like, I don't know, that is something that like is obviously super hard to do and hard to do in our world, but also does like, should like can be like nourishing as well. And like, that's just part of being a human. Like, it's like not like a, it's not like doing what you have to do to like fight a fight, although that's part of it, but like, it's just like to be a human, like, and like take your integrity seriously. I also have one billion thoughts uh, and I don't know if I'm going to uh, put them all together, um, but just a lot of genius things were just said right now. And I think like I'm thinking a lot about what we were, what was mentioned earlier, like kind of on the topic of like um emotional intimacy and like being confronted with like grief and love as like political um and like stories of personal experience I think I'm like hearing especially now like a lot of feelings of like overwhelm and um shame that like people are being confronted with like having um, when, like, under looking, reflecting on, like, their own, um, journey of, like, um, like, learning, especially with, like, more radical texts and, like, global movements, and I think that, like, it's really easy to, like, be, um, stuck in that, um, and it, but it requires, like, this, like, really, a high level of like emotional intimacy to be able to like confront that and like use that for and like turn it into a positive thing like oh I actually like there's actually like I'm never gonna know everything and like I do have so much that I know in my head now and like there's a world of knowledge like ahead of me and like fruitful conversations like we had um and something that like there there was this podcast that I listened to I want to say it's called it's not all in your head I know I sent it to Stephanie for sure it but this episode was about mm, I actually don't remember the title of it um but it's generally the podcast is about like mental health and anti-capitalism and like it's like kind of like externalizing like the things that are happening to you and like your thought patterns and stuff and one of the things that they said in this episode which I'll find later and send in this chat is um that like stagnancy is like literally an impossibility like it's literally impossible for things to never change like that like literally just doesn't happen and so conserv like conservatism was just crushed there because like change literally is always <laughs> happening guys well and like with that like our our like situating ourselves is like lifelong learners and like that and like constantly in this like state of critiquing not only the world around us but like our own like experiences and like biases and like thought patterns and like the way that we interact is like actually like crucial to like this um idea of like constancy 
um, and like being like having um, like uh, that be like one of your foundational forces that like drive how you move. Um, so hope that made sense. <laughs> No, that, that that definitely makes sense, Morgan. Can you uh hold on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, that that um that's been something I've been uh personally reflecting on. Um, a lot recently, I've been reading a lot of um Baldwin. Actually, actually, let me see if I can have the essay here. Reference. Um, but it's from this book of essays here. If anyone wants to read it and wants to take a screenshot um but it's i believe the essay is called the creative process um so definitely take a look at take uh check that out i'll, I'll put that in the chat once i'm done uh speaking here but um baldwin talks about like the uh the duty of like an artist um of the artist in the context of like revolution um and in the context of relation to like look inward to constantly look inward um, and to constantly search, you know, the heart, the mind, the prejudices, the, um, the emotions um, and let the art come out of that. And that in itself is revolutionary. And I know a lot of, a lot of other artists have like um, referred to that concept. I think even Langston Hughes, um, I mean, different artists across, you know, different, um, different forms. Um, but like that, the, the call to, to constantly cultivate like a fight against apathy. And I think like ap like apathy is, is something that like we have to fight against in this day and age, especially um, with like the overstimulation of information of images of the stuff we see, like we can get desensitized and we can become apathetic um, to the things that we see, but um, having that constant state of like, okay, like I'm fucking tired of seeing, you know, the news that you know these kids are dying you know i'm tired of seeing the news that um that there seems to be like nothing i can do but like sitting with that like sitting with those emotions right um sitting with those feelings even like your own like your own personal shit you're going through like i mean the the war machine of capitalism has this way of like um making it feel like this this like super individual struggle when like it's really a collective thing right like we're all just trying to fucking survive in this machine and it sucks that it has to be that way but um like to combat that is to like to combat your heart um your mind uh your your beliefs to, to to challenge them with people to to step outside of your mind you know you know to step outside of yourself and to constantly um evolve like through that struggle um and even like even that struggle like I, I forgot who was who was talking about it. it might have been Grace, um, but um, someone was mentioning um, the fact that like like that's an innate part of it, part of like nature, like struggle and pain. Like that's that's literally like how things are birthed, things are strengthened, um, how things are moved, how things are cultivated. Like you you have like pain is like a natural um, a natural part of human existence, and I think even to relate that to struggle, like that's. That's literally what we have to do for the rest of existence, right? Until the end of time, like that, the universe works in struggle, you know, the constant push and pull, constant uh, bashing. But um, I, made, I had a point, I had a point. I think I made it, but either way, I, I, I think hopefully that, that kind of made sense. Um, yeah, I definitely resonated with everything that's been said so far. So um, definitely, uh, let me type in that essay. Uh, but yeah, let me unmute myself too. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like um, I really appreciate that point you made. I feel like um, I don't fully have this thought together, but being in America, we're really sold this idea of comfort. And um, I think a lot of just engaging in like solidarity is embracing discomfort and recognizing that we are a part like living in America we are a part of um we like propagate Israel and like we have to engage with that discomfort rather than just 
disengage entirely. And I feel like, um, kind of in our, I don't know, like in our modern society is very dissociative and very like being on our phone and being surrounded by like things all the time. I feel like, like my mind just wants to disconnect, but like taking a look at that. And I think again, it comes back to like, like engaging with our humanity again and like yeah anyways I just really enjoyed that point and um thank you for saying all that I had a little thought when Reba was talking about the duty of like artists I I watched like an interview with Mohammed El Kurd a little bit ago and he talked about how like artists that are not from the background that he has have like more freedom he feels with like their subject matter and he feels that for him he like kind of has to take his poetry in a specific direction to do something concrete for like the Palestinian people and that he feels like it's kind of a luxury to like not have to talk about that even or like a privilege would be a way to say it and so I was kind of thinking about like that and like what do the artists feel to like struggle um and obviously there's like a lot of range of responses there's like i don't care i want money i'm gonna go play in israel um and that's like one side and the other is like i'm not sure actually that'd be interesting to think about but yeah do, do, do you mind do you mind if i could make a quick comment to that aria um go ahead thank you thank you um and this is like so personally as um i'm i'm an artist myself and i've been um kind of reflecting on um that same like that same sentiment that same notion and i think i read i read this book is either in middle school or in high school um it was like um an anthology of langston hughes poems right and in the beginning, kind of talked about his, um, like his history, his upbringing. And I'm going to butcher the quote, but um, something he said really resonated with me. He was saying like, like art is like revolutionary. Like art is political. It's meant to be like, that was, in fact, that's the essence of what art is, right? I'm um, like a true artist. Um, and I think in the context of um, even like movements of before, I mean, like the music that was put out, the the poetry that was put out like like that art I believe art is an essential driving force of um the freedom that is to come and I do believe that it, that it will come um but I think that our artists like are, are like artists like fuck shit up in so many different ways like they like they ask the questions that normal people wouldn't ask you know like art that really like makes you think art that breaks breaks out of the box art that makes you question you know why things are viewed this way um art that makes you question perception art that makes you question uh the use of propaganda um the use of words the use of imagery um and like honestly and, and, I, and i've been thinking about this a lot recently like the future that is to come like i'm so glad it's in our hands because we like I, we were born for such a time like this because we we're like we're the generations that like we're like we we look back and we see how mom and dad grandpa and great great grandpa and we look through history and we're like ah this shit is really fucked up like and we're creating shit that like challenges that right the challenges um absolutes you know the concept of things being absolute um the challenges systems, you know, the challenges uh, the way we think. Um, and I think the artists, you know, and, and, I, and I will say this, and, and I, I believe there's a ton of artists in this, in the chat now, whether you might not think you are or not, but um, I just want to encourage you guys, you know, to like, to fucking do like, like, do that shit and do that shit like every day. Like, honestly, it's, and it's, and I don't think it needs to be something like grandiose, like, you need to sit down and like, okay, well, like, what can I make to, uh, to like make something so revolutionary? But no, like your existence is art. Like you are the fucking artist. Like your body, with the way the way you wake up and choose to dress, 
like what what you represent each day like you are the art piece and i believe that's that's something that like once once we change that mindset and we come to terms with the fact that like the fact that like i'm living and breathing like and i'm creating life and breath and when i speak like i'm i move shit when i when i when i move when i'm walking through a room like i change atmospheres like cultivating that confidence like that alone is revolutionary so i mean even in terms of um god i'm i'm going to i'm going to go on a tangent here but I, i'm going to stop i really i really, i will stop but like even in terms of just mere existence you know just living i think like that the call for an artist to live and to live radically like to live with passion to really feel that shit and reflect on that shit and move like that's you know that's going to change the course of history so you know to you guys out there who are doing this shit like keep doing it like it, it, everything will work out so i'm done sorry guys <laughs> I think we're all just in, in awe of the of the speech. Oh. <laughs> yes, no, that was really good. Um, I just feel like I had to com I had to I had to comment that I'm, I've been sitting here listening to you preaching, and, and I've been agreeing on everything you've been saying. So, you speak your stuff, Rebo. Something like with all of that that I've been thinking about too is like. I don't know, because like, well, and this is going back to the point you made a little bit earlier about how like, um, yeah, like so much of like life itself has like is like involves like hurt and violence and, and also like death fundamentally. And like, I feel like um, I was thinking about how like also like, yeah, I feel like in the US, there's also just like this huge like fear of death and like unwilling to like look at death and and pain and like all that leads up to it and like um which also like touches on the like desire for comfort that like was also brought up too and like I feel like that like just like as a like a like little add-on to what you were saying I feel like art can both like yeah reacquaint us with life and also with death which are like both just like things that really need to be done for like a healthy person Um, yeah, I think that I'm glad that, okay, um, sorry, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I'm glad that you brought that point up, Grace, because I think that, like, well, our last meeting, we, I feel like we had, on Radical Intimacy, I feel like we had a really, like, beautiful conversation about like death and grieving and um that I can't summarize adequately right now but I think that like um the uh I think that Rifka that was something that like resonated with me a lot was like the uh, there were, were a lot of times where I was like really um just like had to put shit down for a second because it was like just really powerful like what um Mohammed al Kurd was saying about like how um like about death and about grief and about like um literally imminent death like having to like think about that like as like a person living in like occupied Palestine um and I think that that was okay the the there was one 
one thing that like has kind of stuck with me also was like his he talked a lot about like um the I think like the romanticization of martyrdom and like um one um thing that stuck with me was on it was page 29 which is oh I have it right here um 15 year old girl killed for attempting to kill a soldier with a nail file or context um and he talks about commissioning compassion turning heroes into humans and distinguishing martyrs from like as like persons who go with intent and then like versus somebody who went with um a bullet and I think that like that was like that was just a quote that like really stuck with me um and I think that like a lot of people especially in this moment are being confronted with like one imagery of like death and dying and then conversations around it and like really candidly um which is like really hard um and another thing like on separately like um the one thing that I think I heard from I tried to find the video but somebody on Instagram reels (laughs) said this but um she was talking about like um indigenous wisdom as it relates to grieving and she defined grief as love with no place to go and I think that was like that's been something that I've been like thinking about a lot and just like um recognizing grief as like your own like human capacity for love and like um being like the the power and like being able to not be numb to these feelings and to like continue to um like sit with them and recognize them Um, that quote is, is so beautiful. Um, and I just want to read it out loud to kind of speak that um, into the atmosphere and kind of um, gaze everyone's heart on it. But it says, uh, to be loving is to be open to grief, to be touched by sorrow, even sorrow that is unending. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think um, even just uh, a brief reflection of that, I think the importance to establish community um, as we go through this constant grief and constant struggle that really is unending um, is like is vital, you know, in this day and time, like whatever community you hold dear you know even this right now like, I think this is this is so beautiful um but even your own personal community like making sure you're taking care of like your heart and mind because this shit is tough like this shit is tough I think I just saw someone post um oh I forgot their name they were like a prominent um 
Palestinian like storyteller and 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 a couple like journalists um I think I posted recently um on Instagram like they're just their devastation and their hopelessness right now you know as they're witnessing death every day as they're confronted with their own death um and even seeing that in real time like it's heartbreaking you know and um yeah like we have we have to lean on each other like I think that's one of the most important things in the context of, you know, um, a revolution or whatever you want to call it, but taking care of each other, like a community, stepping outside of like the stronghold of individualism that capitalism has like, you know, perpetuated um, and just care, like fucking having a heart, like caring about someone, you know, even just saying hi, like just, checking in on someone um and generally doing it you know from a place of understanding that like um like this human experience like we need connection like we need to be connected to the struggle we need to be connected to each other um on a daily basis um and i and i, and I think we'll be okay you know if we if we step outside of ourselves um and ask for help in those moments you know when when things do get hard because they do get hard like even even like the history of all these great movements and um even these great leaders like they burnt out man most of them burnt out and like it, it's 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 tough seeing that like like what could have been if um you know the weight of the world hadn't crushed them um or if there was a stronger community um and i think we have a call in our generations to really change that um i'm i read this book um it's called emergent strategy by adrian marie brown i'm sure you guys are i'm seeing i'm seeing i'm seeing faces okay cool so i think most of you probably either read it or know about it ah uh, phenomenal author phenomenal author but um i'll i mean I'll, I'll i'll let you guys read it for yourselves you know i won't summarize it or anything but definitely um i definitely suggest um reading it and i think I think it'll I think it'll do some things to your heart. Um but yeah. Uh just check on your homies. Like check on your girls. Check on your day thems. Like <laughs> do what you gotta do. Like <laughs> check on your people, you know. Uh and like we're 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 in this thing together. Like this 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 fight is is better won together and it will be won together, so <laughs> um we're going to wrap up soon so if anyone has like any final thoughts or anything before we wrap up it's all you um also Rebo thank you for reading that quote out loud um I like I go back to that quote like all of the time um just to like think about people like in my own life that I've lost um yeah I think it's really cool to think about like the feeling of grief as just like you just love something so hard that you miss it and that's what grief is yeah does um, anyone have Okay. Oh, okay. I just kind of what the Palestinian struggle kind of makes me think about in general is like decolonization. And there was a specific quote in Rifka about like the reality of decolonization being like a bloodbath, basically. So it's kind of like a question like, what does decolonization look like, both like globally and like specifically for Palestine and for like. I'm guessing most of us are from the U.S. kind of have that as our context. So, um, but for other places too, you know, like Latin America, other places. But yeah, that's my thought. Um, I believe the quote that you're referring to is um, Fanon, which is on page twenty nine. In its fair reality, decolonization reeks of red hot cannonballs and bloody mess. Oh, 
which I think is from Wretched of the Earth. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Um, okay. Thank you guys so, so much for joining us today. Um, I feel very thankful to leave with so much to think about and so much to talk to other people about and share. Um, we made a Reddit thread for the people so that yes morgan just dropped it in the chat um so if you have like any other thoughts yes thank you lauren our our admin that is not here because she got freaking scheduled to work um made it yeah so if you have any like final thoughts or like your like weeks from now or days from now you're like thinking more about this um feel free to add like literally anything and we can just keep keep talking um for okay announcements for december we're not going to do a book of the month um we are going to be planning some events doing some some like yeah some events so uh we'll be posting about it like on our instagram and stuff um so just keep an eye out for updates on our instagram um i don't think i have any more updates um so i'm gonna pass it to morgan how do we all stay connected so we were th the reddit thread we were thinking we could use that as a place for people to just like dump and say like just keep talking about whatever we want to talk about um yeah you can always message us on our instagram like we will respond um yeah yeah with that um and the conversations we were having earlier about everyone's interests varying like interests in artistry we love collaboration so if at any point anyone wants to shout out um or a platform to elevate like their own work um or put it in conversation with like a text that is like very important to you or relates to like anything any of the themes that like we've explored before please feel free to reach out because we would love to have um, community like contributions for like um, whether it be like article writing or I don't know anything else you could think of we're pretty much open to it we love to share all, everyone's work and ideas and make, hopefully the reddit thread does like become a space for people to like provide their updates and build, com build community in times that where like we're either like we don't have a book of the month or ideas pop up that you're scared are going to like leave you by the time the actual meeting comes around so feel free to engage in any way but thank you so much to everyone that has like collaborated with us and yeah feel free to drop feel free to drop your guys' socials um make sure to uh follow and get your friends to follow Hard for Hotties Book Club. And we also want to close off with our guiding values, but I'm gonna pass it on to Morgan to talk a bit more about what inspired that. Hey guys. Um, so yeah, freaking drop your Instas um, and let's all be besties. Um, and yeah. We're going to end with the our guiding values. Um, we've been doing this since like the summer-ish, which was after Stephanie, Grace, Allison, I, Allison and I all attended our first no-name book club 
um which is hosted like which was in at the columbus chapter which is hosted by the columbus chapter of the national organization black men build um and uh i would like encourage you guys to um attend no name uh i know yeah finn um rebo and i all went yesterday and that was just so amazing um st louis uh does have a chapter as well which is hosted by noir bookshop and um they're just so amazing um and like yeah wherever you're located um definitely like support them attend when you can um because yeah no name is doing a lot of like really awesome work um on the national and local levels um but uh throughout after at the end of like the meeting when um like we had all gone for our first time um they ended with their guiding values to kind of like center everyone on like the guiding principles like why we're here um so that's kind of what inspired us to engage in that practice as well um and i'm gonna start with uh community and creative collaboration which stephanie described this perfectly um just now but we recognize that um collective interdependence is fundamental to the livelihood and liberation of our kin in a social and political environment where individualism is largely advanced as the status quo and community breeds uh, creativity through um, constructive and positive feedback. Um, the relationships and partnerships which we engage, engage in are creatively constructed, inspiring itself radical change that pre precipitates the imagining of ideal community spaces and systems, worlds, and lives outside of those that are traditionally used to dominate and oppress. And we also want to make sure that Hardcore Rahadis is a radically alternative space, which for us means a space that really tries to make up for the ways that we might have been hurt by institutions in the past, such as the traditional classroom settings. Um, instead, we want to welcome unconventional approaches to education and focus more on care and compassion in order to challenge hierarchies and center curiosity. I'm also going to be talking about our, our value of friendship as care work, um, which Lauren usually talks about. But again, to honor um, her, we're going to talk about how we think friendship is very active and it comes along with a dedication to the creation and maintenance of a safe and inclusive space where old and new friends always feel valued, heard and respected and assumes that everyone who enters their spaces are being held accountable to this, those similar standards. For us, friendship means safety, comfortability and empathy, and it's always purely nurturing and compassionate. And then our final value is intention and integrity. Um, so what we mean by this is that us and all of the members uh, move through each day intentionally and with integrity, um, defining the group as practitioners who habits embody the work with which we interact. It is through observation of purposeful and deliberate action and interaction that our dedication to intention and integrity is recognized as honesty, transparency, and sincerity that is grounded in strong moral virtue, which we are deeply committed. Integrity recognizes responsibility and power held and actively works to dismantle accountability as a shameful tool in redefining it as a positive mechanism through which personal growth is encouraged and goodwill is assumed as the norm. Um, thank I was just going to say you, thank you, everyone, for um, attending the meeting. I also wanted to make a quick note to point you guys towards um, our tote bags for Palestine post, which you can see um, by scrolling through our Instagram. We want to thank you for taking the time to learn in community with us today. And if you read more about that post, we basically wanted to offer 
um, a tiny bit of like an incentive to show efforts of solidarity with Palestine um, by giving people, <laughs> thank you, Asher, but <laughs> to, um, by giving people a original Hartha Rahadi's um, book club is for lovers tote bag that were hand printed by our friend Dave. So if you guys just like send us a DM after this would count for that. You guys can look at the post too and share it with your friends. But basically your attendance today and the time you took out of your schedule to engage with this text shows just so much like love and solidarity for Palestine. So if you're interested in getting a tote bag for this, just send us a DM after. But yes, we're so grateful that we were able to like share this time together today. And it's always so great to make new, oh yeah, Morgan's showing up fun packaging to um, Christmas gift ideas, but it's always so great to learn alongside old and new friends. And I'm really looking forward to a new year and a month of just really interacting with you all. So thank you. Okay, wait, I do have a question about the Reddit if while we're here. Just the the link, I might not know how to use it, but like it takes me to like a generic submit page. I don't know if that's like maybe I just need to be shown what button to press, but or yeah. maybe it's not right. I don't know. I'll find a new I'll... Okay, cool. Our hard covered hobbies joining. Oh yeah, I've got the, here's the actual link. Okay, awesome. The Reddit.